Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the fifth week of the 2017 series of the uh, Digital Classes London Seminars. Today we have a slightly different um, format for our seminar. We have two speakers instead of one, and they are um, two PhD researchers. Uh, we will have uh, Lucia Vanini from the ICS. Uh, and Paola Granado Garcia from um, Open University. Uh, we will start with uh, Lucia's presentation and she will uh, talk about the role of digital humanities in papyrology practices and user needs in papyrological research. Over to you, Lucia. Thank you. A still debated problem in digital humanities is the sparse acceptance in humanities scholarship of many of the numerous existing digital resources. It has been demonstrated that this availability of resources is not matched by a wide adoption from practicing scholars. Although they show a deep interest in these projects, they eventually prefer to resort to generic information material like catalogs or libraries rather than to the wide range of resources currently available online, which can provide new methods to analyze, visualize, and think about source material. This marginal usage of digital tools and services raised the question of whether tool builders are carrying out studies on user needs and using methods to verify the adoption of these resources. Inquiries have shown that only a small part of tool developers verify the actual use of their products and ask the user for feedback. In recent years, however, digital humanists have begun to bridge the gap in studies on user needs and on usability of humanities resources. Many of these studies have focused on the evaluation of digital libraries, like for classics, the Perseus Digital Library, the Digital Latin Library, and uh, other case studies for classics concern uh, infrastructure for the use of the open data methods, such as Pelagios, two linguistic tools, the English to Greek and Latin word search, and the Greek and Latin morphological analysis, both provided by Perseus, and a study by Laura Loser on the audiences of epigraphical editions and how their needs can be met when we create digital editions. Within this context of the diffusion of user studies for humanities and classics, I am focusing in my PhD dissertation on user needs in a discipline of the ancient world for which this kind of research has not been conducted yet, papyrology the study of ancient books and private documents found in archaeological excavations rather than handed down to us through the medieval transmission. I will now illustrate the methods I have chosen for collecting data on the use of digital papyrological resources by papyrologists and other researchers of classics. And I will then focus on the first results I have gathered, that is those from 18 interviews Interviewees belong to different universities, Leuven, Heidelberg, Liverpool, Florence, and Naples. They are PhD students, postdoc researchers, research assistants, and university teachers. As well as through interviews, I am collecting data through user observation, and I have planned the use of a questionnaire. As each method presents both advantages and weak points, using a combination of them, is recommended in user experience research. I am using interviews because they allow for an in-depth discussion on a topic and they mostly, and they mostly fo focus on user experience as users' point of view should be elicited from the actions they actually carry out while using the resources rather than from general opinions. However, interviews do not take place while users are working. While they are actually using a resource. That is why it is important to carry out user observations as well, 
which consists in directly observing researchers' behavior while they perform some tasks and while they think aloud to explain their choices. Although this method does not enable to delve deeply into an issue because the observer must not start discussing or interfere, it provides the most reliable information on how people use a resource during their activities. A questionnaire is instead a method that allows reaching a higher number of people. Therefore, as much as it does not allow for the discussion and is not carried out at the time when one is using a resource, it is useful to obtain quantitative results for statistical analysis. The interviews conducted so far highlighted that the behavior of users of digital papyrological resources mirrors the one of humanity scholars pinpointed in user studies. The most used digital collections and tools are the papyrological navigator on papyri.info and the Trismegistos for documentary papyri and the Leuven database of ancient books and the Mertens Park 3 for literary papyri. They are used to find the bibliographical information, images of papyri, or to search for words or specific kinds of primary sources, allowing users to work from home or anyway to find quickly bibliography, which is not near at hand. In other words, digital resources help them in that they speed up their search for information, their existing practices, but new research methodologies are not being adopted for visualizing or as analyzing in new ways the data. Two interviewees expressed this concept clearly, I'm quoting, the things I do would be technically possible with traditional resources as well, but it would take me much more time. Instead, through digital resources, I can find the papyrus very quickly, or I can find all the papyri in the Ptolemaic archive by just entering Ptolemaic archive on Trismegistos. By using digital resources, I go a lot faster, can work from home, and can look at images. An archaeologist specialized in Ostraca says, when asked what the advantages for her research are, Ostraca have been re-edited many times. Therefore, they have many additional numbers. Uh, but now I only need to enter one of these numbers and I get all the correspondences between the editions, which is far quicker than browsing the printed books. So my work becomes lighter. This is true also from the point of view of the search for parallels, for instance, of texts on the same topic. But even once you found your material so quickly, you need to carry out your research yourself all the same. In a more limited number of cases, databases are used to do statistics. For example, on the publication of different kinds of ostraca by means of combined search of the material pottery with the provenance or a historical period or else a language like Aramaic. There is a very limited use of an innovative method like uh, social network analysis, which is illustrated in Trismegistos Network, one of the subsets of the Trismegistos platform for the study of ancient texts. A series of articles and blog posts from the Trismegistos team has illustrated how social network analysis enables to study relations between people or places attested in papyri and descriptions. However, this advanced methodology has not been adopted outside the Trismegistos team in Leuven, and an interviewee stayed, stated that it requires skills that are too technical and take too much time to be learned, and another researcher, while looking at the graph provided in the record of a text in Trismegistos, said it was too difficult to understand even what it was. As for the reason of this, I would say that um, user studies 
so that humanities scholars are willing to learn how to use a resource if a research task is essential for them and if they are sure the resource will provide high quality information. In this case, they persist and try and learn new skills, even with a difficult interface of functionality, while they are ready to abandon a resource whose quality or possibilities of use for the research uh, they are not sure about. In this case, in my view, there is a problem of communication between the Trismegistos network and the users because of the separation between this database and the others in Trismegistos. While in Trismegistos network database, there are several examples of the use of social network analysis. Uh, only few graphs can be found in the other databases of texts, places, or people. And uh, these graphs should have a wider explanation with no need to, to go to the, to the other network database. We now move to see what features users cannot find in the current development of papyrological resources and would like to see implemented in future plans. One of the most mentioned need is the one for a greater accuracy both in the text of Papari and in the metadata. For examples about texts, a researcher remarked on the lack of division into lines for all the texts. This happens in the Ravenna Papari and the tablet, tablets Albertini on the papyrological navigator. About metadata, the same person found conflicting and generic information in the records of the Papari. I'm quoting again. Um, in Trismegistos, at the beginning, you think that the dating like 175, 225 is the one actually assigned by the scholars. It looks like a, a real dating. Uh, only later you understand that it is a convention requested by the database system for the wording end of the second century, beginning of the third century, which would be clearer. Moreover, I'm still quoting, many abbreviations of editions where the papyrus is cited are unclear as they are cited in many different ways. Resources need more uniformity in the way texts are presented. Some records are super detailed, while others are not at all, as there is only the text. There is a great disparity between the same website. This happens with Trismegistos and papyri.info. And similarly, another interviewee stated, often in databases, but not in papyri.info, you find a photo without a metric scale and dimensions. Therefore, I need to go and see the original traveling a lot. One more problem is the frequent lack of indication about the material in that the information only reads poetry. There should be a more accurate treatment of the material. As a response to my question on whether this is a problem of printed editions too, she answers, uh, it is, but she adds, I understand that databases make digital what was printed, but it is like chasing one stale, as one goes on always doing in the same way, and we do not progress. As it emerges, there is a need for the same accuracy uh, as one can find in printed editions, or if these were too generic, users expect digital resources, copy of the source material, but that digitization is also an occasion for an improvement. The need for philological accuracy also emerges from user appreciation of resources that are accurate and are in continuity with existing tools with which one has been taught to study. For instance, an interviewee greatly appreciates the Vindolanda tablets online collection. I am quoting, this is a wonderful data bank because there is so much information. Texts have a commentary line by line, an introduction, there is information on paleography, signs, monetary units, weights, etc as well as the text. In sum, there is everything. 
they reported all the information that is in the print edition. This kind of resources is appreciated even if they are not created with advanced uh, digital methods, provided that uh, they respond to specific questions. For instance, two interviewees use the Wörter listing, a list of nouns attested in papyri, which is available as a PDF file through the Institute for Papyrology of the University of Heidelberg. One of the interviewees said she uses it to do searches of proper nouns, which are reported in a dedicated section. She wants to be sure to find the proper nouns only and not also common nouns that are identical to proper nouns, which sometimes happens. She finds it comfortable as it is the continuation of a print reference tool, Prisicus Name Book. So she can follow the same practice she's used to. Whether, uh, when I asked whether she knows Trismegistos people, a comprehensive database of proper nouns attested in papyri and descriptions, she says she does not know it, but uh, now that she knows, she will surely look at it. And um, this example illustrates how a better communication to inform scholars of the existence of the new resources is needed. More needs pointed out by users are a greater interconnection between different resources and the digitization of more kinds of texts like uh, literary papyri and magical papyri. In, in conclusion, I think what emerges from these interviews and the examples reported is that user needs for papyrological resources are overall not different from those pinpointed in user studies for humanities and scholars in general. And they are critical about both printed and digital resources, have models to evaluate them. They are willing to learn new skills if they find them useful for the research, otherwise they may be discouraged and uh, may dismiss them. They give up searching as soon as they have sufficient information, rather than doing more complex searches to have complete results. And Papyrologists also share with classical philologists the needs for philological accuracy that uh, has been required for electronic resources like the TLG2. We can, however, see how digital resources are taking into consideration this need and are changing accordingly with the introduction of the philological apparatus in the papyrological navigator and in the recently developed digital corpus of literary papyri. The latter is also attempting to bridge a gap in the digitization of this type of text as demanded by scholars. In addition to this, I think it would be important that resources clearly state what their aim is uh, to help bridge the expectation gap among scholars who sometimes believe tools are capable of more than they are, another common problem identified in user studies in digital humanities. Databases um, should inform clearly about their main aim and the possibilities allowed for one research. For example, um, the main goal of the papyrological navigator is providing the text of the papyri or for Trismegistos, providing the metadata to allow for several kinds of searches, statistics, or reuse of the material for other projects. And in this context, the presence of a complete bibliography demanded by scholars is um, secondary, and the lack of a complete apparatus for all the texts, which is, however, now being added, does not seem to significantly influence the results of the user queries. And uh, it is anyway crucial that uh, more user studies are conducted and for different disciplines of the ancient world to have a more complete picture of user needs in all the stages of the development of the resources, not only after their implementation, but ideally also before and during the process of the implementation itself, 
to avoid the erroneous perceptions of how a resource will be used in the real life or work activities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucia. This was really, really interesting. You're doing a, a killer PhD. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions for Lucia. Yes, I don't know. Thank you. That was really fascinating. I'm, I think you know, the whole study of talking about what people expect from these resources as opposed to what we think they're making is a really interesting one. Did you talk to your interviewees about online help, the resources that projects give? That in my experience is that people expect us to be able to intuitively understand what to do and will ignore all the effort that we put into writing help pages. Was that your experience? Or did you talk to them about the, the, the sort of self-taught process of finding out how to use resources and did people just expect to be able to uh, yes, for example, um, in user observations uh, during a workshop, uh, um, my impression was that uh, uh, the, the help page, the, the documentation page for the pathological editor in this case, uh, well, users uh, didn't uh, look uh, too much at it. Uh, um, uh, yes, and um, also, um, for example, when users uh, find a mistake in a resource, mm -hmm. um, well, in the help page, in the contact mm -hmm. page, um, it's explained uh, how to, to contact the team, how to yes. inform about the errors. But uh, uh, yes, um, a user told me it's difficult to, to find this uh, information. And uh, anyway, maybe they say uh, feedback or uh, remark uh, so for them uh, in, and also uh, she wasn't in english native speaker it's difficult to understand uh, that it, it means to uh, point out uh, an error that's what i've been asking so far <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so you don't expect, I don't want this any more than one, but in general, we know help is a national issue. Help is really difficult to write because you're writing for so many different ranges of expertise. Um, and you've also got that problem that people don't want to spend that much time reading on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. So also, it may be difficult to find. Yeah, it's useful backup for, for, for personal mm -hmm. support because you can point. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you don't want to read the entire help to find exactly the problem that you are having. So you should have some structure to help. Yeah. Yeah. Would be nice. Just to leave it to the community to solve their own problems. We had a question on the back, uh, yeah. So, yeah. As a daily user of the pathological value, one of my big frustrations is the downloadable nature of the information, particularly the metadata and the rest. So I just wondered if any of the other folks who have been using this on a day to day basis, yeah, whether they find it difficult because what I'm having to do is transcribe data from the you know, methods or um, the operational navigator into my database, which in itself is a process of potential bulk. Mm. So it would be much better to download the bulk in the search. Sorry, it's mm -hmm. a long question, but it, this is, does anybody else share that research? Uh, no, actually, no, I've never heard about this uh, problem. Oh, about, uh, my, no, my no, because they, they don't download, the, the users I interview with. interview they don't uh, have to download it data, but only use the, the paparological navigator for world uh, searches, for finding parallels, uh, or finding simply the, the text when uh, they hadn't the, the volumes uh, near at hand. <coughs> 
because truth and is also a, a, a large info. If you wanted to download the link to raw data, yep, you can do that. You, you, can, you can do researches on that and transform that exactly. into a format you need to put in the database. But then the metadata are more than the fact they're in. Yeah. But it's a format. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you need to be a programmer to, to do that work, mm -hmm. really. The intermediate work, where what you want to do is you do a search, you find 32 results, and download simple concept related values mm -hmm. that you can put somewhere. That's something I've, I've not seen in any of these databases. That would be really useful. Yeah. Okay. okay, we have time for one last question for Lucia. Yes? Do people expect to cite these resources? Do they refer to them? Or do they just see them as transparent sheets of glass that they look through? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is an interesting question to, to ask in the next uh, interviews because uh, I didn't ask this uh, explicitly. Um, once um, an interviewee told uh, he, he cited the graph he found in Trismegistos uh, people uh, so to, sh to show uh, the frequency of a name in the uh, uh, But because uh, he was working with the um, class VORP, a papyrologist in Leiden, and uh, he, he suggested him to look at the Trismegistos people, uh, to use this graph. Uh, and yes, otherwise he, he didn't uh, know about this. Uh, he, this was what uh, uh, pushed him to also to cite. Um, yes, we didn't talk about it. Okay, I have one very last question for you, and, <laughs> and then we move to Paola. Um, and is in, in your in your experience, um, how open are uh, the creators of these online resources to modify something in their structure in their help page after receiving users' feedback? Hmm. Do you think they they would do it? They are looking for users' feedback, or you know. The product is closed and you have to learn how to deal with it no no i think they are open to to do changes uh, yes like in this megistos uh, uh, mark uh, the pow the the main uh, person in charge of the resource uh, they they just did an update um, especially for uh, the interface of one of the databases, Trismegistus uh, Collection, um, which is a more usable interface now. Um, yes, um, on the other hand, I think these um, changes that uh, there are also in other resources, yes, maybe um, the, yes, the feedback from, from the users uh, um, yes, there is the lack of uh, communication. Uh, and there are changes, uh, yes, maybe um, maybe according to what they, they, ex they expect, what they, they think it is better, but uh, yes, I think there is this, uh, this lack of uh, communication on both sides, because also users uh, told me, yes, I saw there was a mistake, but uh, for me it was extra work to... Mm -hmm. Complicated. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, or um, but I don't like this resource, so I don't want to even to, mm. to communicate this. So on both sides, uh, there are uh, yes, problems. Oh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Lucia. Um, we might have some time for more questions <laughs> later, <laughs> and uh, I am very happy to introduce now. Uh, Paola Granados Garcia, who will be talking about uh, cultural contact in early Roman Spain through linked open data resources. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Valeria, and thank you very much, Lucia, for such a nice presentation. Uh, okay, so I'm going to speak about cultural contact in early Roman Spain through linked open data. 
And I could spend a long time speaking about cultural contact and the uh, long study, uh, long tradition that this uh, concept has has in, in disciplines such as anthropology, ethnography, and so on. Nevertheless, it's right the afternoon, and the Italian <laughs> classicist seminars this summer are focused on the user needs and the impediments that us as classicists and archaeologists can find in the application of digital technologies to our research. So because of that, I am to focus a bit more on my um, methodology and the problems that I have found uh, relating to data collection, data modeling, data, data querying, and so on. So uh, very briefly, what is cultural contact? Well, uh, cultural contact has been uh, what well, refers to the interaction between at least two communities that come from different ethnic or cultural backgrounds, usually leading to change in both systems. One of the uh, uh, products of this uh, change can be the diffusion and the uh, assimilation of cultural influences and cultural traits. What needs to be emphasized here is that the results of this cultural change are not only experienced by the community who uh, uh, perceives these influences, but also by the community who promotes this diffusion. And this seems to be uh, a bit ignored in traditional scholarship. Uh, so this is very interesting, especially in the case of Spain because uh, we have no archaeological evidence of uh, Roman peoples in the peninsula before the Second Punic War. We know that there were two Greek colonies in the northeast, in Emporio and Rhodes, and uh, there were two, uh, well, there were royal several, uh, but two main uh, Carthaginian settlements in Saguntum and Cartagonova. So, uh, Carthaginians come to the peninsula before the Second Punic War to recruit troops and uh, coins in order to uh, get ready to the war. And uh, in order to avoid this threat and to defeat Carthaginian army, Romans come to the peninsula and uh, the war starts. After they come in the 218 BC, they keep spreading their influence over the peninsula until 19 BC when the conquest is finished. And this is very rough the three uh, zones of control over this time. This is very important. Well, it's interesting because when Romans come to the peninsula, uh, many, are, uh, many scholars have argued that they don't have a defined program, defined colonizing program. So what they did was to kind of um, uh, looked at the prefix uh, and pre-existing habits of the uh, communities and uh, uh, tried to uh, um, to behave uh, in consequence to to adapt themselves to that uh, so where can cultural contact be perceived well if we wanted to study cultural contact nowadays it would be relatively easy to run a comparative study and interview people and see what kind of phenomena can we see in, uh, such as uh, cultural shock or other processes but we cannot interview romans and iberians and ask them what they felt so because of this if we want to study cultural contact in antiquity we need to look at uh, both uh, archaeological evidence and material culture or literary evidence. A lot of work has been done on literary evidence, in, especially in Spain, and the uh, Roman uh, per perception of the conquest. So because of that, I am especially interested in material culture and uh, the archaeological record of the peninsula. And I'm going to look at it through uh, four main uh, indices, which are the settlements, this is the archi uh, architectural and urbanistic remains, the epigraphy, so the inscriptions, numismatics, which are coins and means, uh, the production spot of the co uh, coins, and a sculpture, iconography and influences in the style, in the manufacture, and so on. So, settlements. Where can we perceive cultural contact and how can we perceive cultural contact in settlements? Where we can look at the number, if this increases or decreases, the urbanism and the organization, the architecture, if they introduce new materials or new ways of uh, uh, construction, such as, oh, for example, tabulae or in materials and so on, uh, the evolution of the settlement and the name. The name is a especially interesting feature, which is already being recorded in um, 
gazetteers because after the Roman arrival, many places changed their name and people need to get used to the new name that their houses or their communities have. And this uh, is being recorded in gazetteers following this uh, data model. So we have a place A that has a, a name one, uh, which belongs to a time span, name two, uh, which belongs to another time span. And this is how they record it. And this is a, a good example from a Playa les Gazetteer of the Spanish place of Osuna in the south of the peninsula, which is recorded with three names. So we have Osuna, which is the modern name, Urso, which was the Iberian name, and Colonia Genitiva uh, Julia, which uh, was the Roman name. So if I told my mom, mom, I'm going to Colonia Genitiva Julia, she, would be, she wouldn't understand what I'm talking about. But if, if I said Osuna, she would know what I mean. Uh, regarding the epigraphy, the same, we can look at the number of inscriptions, if this decrease or increase, in which language, the fine spot, the material, the content. And the language is, in fact, one of my favorite features because uh, if we look at this, uh, these are two drawings of two uh, funerary inscriptions from, Tara from Taraco in the north of Spain. Uh, they, they were made in the 19th century, but the uh, scriptures are now lost. And if we transcribe this to a language that we can actually read, the first one reads, Aretake, a timbelauer, an italskar, fulvia lintearia. Aretake is the Iberian formula for ex situs, in Latin, so here is buried. Then, a timbelauer and an italskar are the names of the people who are buried. And fulvia lintearia is the name of the person who paid for this tomb. So this is very interesting in terms of cultural contact because it is a bilingual inscription, but it's also very interesting in terms of identity because why would you record your name in the working language, which was Latin, while recording the name of the people who have that in their original or the language of their ancestors? This has many implications in such terms, and it would, it's very interesting to look at this as well. And this is another example of, of another bilingual inscription. The same regarding sculpture, Roman, uh, or local number, material, iconography, what is the significance of the patterns, are the local aspects uh, a manifestation of the local ethnicity, and so on. These are aspects that are worth to look at. And numismatics, the number of the means, location of the means, evolution, provenance, fine spot, iconography, legend. We have more than 120 legends, Iberian legends of coins, so there were uh, uh, coins. And the questions, is there an increase of coin use, is appearance, is monetization a response to civic impetus? And this is another interesting example from, it's a Republican coin from Bailo Claudia with a bilingual inscription in Latin, the name of the city in, well, the name of the town in Latin and Neoponic. So it's very interesting and well. Okay, so now that we are experts in cultural contact, how can we implement or enhance our research uh, applying digital technologies? Well, as you know, archaeology is uh, a science, one of the disciplines with the highest data sets of all times. Uh, we have GIS, 3D modeling has been recently included, um, um, photogrammetry, photographs, and many, many other uh, stuff. But the, the, the main problem is not the, how large this is, but how can we establish connection between all this data? Because if we have so much information and we cannot access to it, what's the point? Well, limit open data. Looked, uh, well, establishes connections between digital objects by looking at the aspects they share in common. So that if we are looking for a specific object, we can get information about that object that comes from all many different places. And this provides a lot of new information in an open access format. Okay, uh, how do we produce linked open data? Well, this is the linked open data in Sydney. So the URIs is the basic, the most important aspect. These are kind of the fingerprints of our digital objects. Uh, we need to give uh, URIs to our objects to make sure we are always referring to the same thing. And so everybody can know what we are referring to. Then um, we need a language that is uh, readable at the same time by humans and machines. And this is the RDF. RDF is a language that is based on statements that are constituted by three uh, elements, subject, predicate, and object. And this object will be our URI. 
And uh, also we need to make sure that the, uh, um, the object that we are referring to as an inscription is at the same time an inscription for me, for the researcher and the computer. And how do we do this? By modeling our data. Ontologies, established classes, and vocabularies uh, through which we can tell the computer uh, the concepts that we are uh, using in our research. Then we establish uh, through the URIs, we establish links with other databases, and we can query finally our data, we can make questions to our database and visualize uh, the results. Uh, so, in general, very uh, generally, why link data? Because we get more data, we establish relationships between data the, from different sources, we can develop self computational analysis and finally reach our interpretations. And so, we get to the uh, interesting part, which is my case study. Uh, um, Sarah Middle, in the first seminar, she talked about how uh, in her initial findings she had uh, discovered that many of the linked data uh, projects were looking at, uh, were, were creating their own data instead of using the data which was already available. And my project uh, looks specifically at how to consume linked data and how to use linked data which is already available because I don't have nor the time or the funding to create all this new data. Data. So, consuming linked open data, how do we do that? First, define a research question, a case study, something specific that we can look at. Second, evaluate the sources and data sets that might provide interesting data. We can use a search engine or a catalog to look for data sets. Make sure we can get that data, establish consumption patterns. This seems very complicated, but it's just to decide what data you're going to collect and declare it. Um, manage alignment, uh, matching different vocabularies, and create linked data applications to serve users. This is not compulsory, I'm not doing that, but you can do that. You can uh, create interfaces and uh, allow people to, to look at your data as well. These are the data sets that I am looking at, Aracne, eh, Europeana, Epigraph, eh, Epigraphic Database, eh, Heidelberg, Nomisma, Mantis, Pelagius Annotations, and so on. And now I'm going to speak about some of the problems that I have found when uh, collecting the data from some of these data sets, the main ones that I have already looked at. From Pelagius and Pleiades, this is one of the best tools. Uh, this is a, a screen a capture of my search in, Pe, in Pelagios, in Peripleo. We can see um, here on the top, I have written the name of Vaetica, and I uh, have refined my uh, search by looking at specifically, I have said from 2nd century BC to 1st century AD. And these are all the results that I obtain. And also, uh, it tells me the sources, the language, and so on. Uh, it's a very user-friendly interface because you don't need to know anything about the data to use it. Uh, also, all the, all the uh, data is linked to a place reference, which is very useful. Uh, there is the possibility to report mistakes, as someone of you were asking. This is very useful. You just need to create a PlayNS account and say, here is a mistake, and they will see if it's true or not. Uh, and then it has two important, two interesting uh, tools, which is Peripleo um, and Recogito. Peripleo is this one here, and Recogito allows you to create uh, annotations in the form of linked data, which is also very useful because if you see a gap in your data, you can actually uh, include that data, and you don't need to know how to program or how to do complicated things. Uh, you can do a RDF uh, download from player. You can download your data from player list. There is an API. The only thing that I have found is that there is no Sparkle endpoint, so you cannot export filter RDF. It's the only thing. But there are other ways to do this if you know how to program. Then ABH, the same. You can do both downloads. There is an API which uh, returns JSON. Uh, there is the possibility of uh, to filter the data. There is a Sparkle endpoint. You can also download the data in CSV. And it uses vocabularies from Miguel Anomisma, which is actually very useful because these are two of the data sets that I am also uh, looking at. And finally, Nomisma. This is one of my favorite uh, ones. 
uh, because it has a Sparkle endpoint, so you can query the data, you can extract the data in RBF or CSV or JSON or many other formats. It has information about Roman and Perman means, and the only problem with my research is that the means are not dated. So I cannot run queries on per Roman and Roman means. I can just obtain all the means. This is a map that I have done. So uh, I queried uh, the data, I queried the data set in a Sparkle. I run a query looking, asking for the means in the province of Vaetica, and I got a, a list of all the means, and with that I produce a, a map. What's the problem? I don't know what of these means were before, were, were Iberians or, or were Roman or, or the date, or the, that, the, sorry, the date of this, the period of these means. And that's what I am looking at at the moment. How can I add dates and how can I query dates in Sparkle? And so once uh, we have collected out your own, your data, you go to the next step, more than your data. So uh, choose uh, ontologies and vocabularies that can um, um, include the concepts that you are using in your research. CRM is the uh, main or more complete ontology for cultural heritage. However, um, this is a much too complex uh, project for my small research. So that is why I'm not using CRM, but I am using a smaller and more specific uh, ontologies that have been expanded, like e the EGET vocabulary, which has types of material culture, inscriptions, uh, and the material of the inscriptions, and so on. And also the Romism ontology, what's the problem? That these ontologies do not uh, have any type of reference to cultural contact. Uh, they don't speak about bilingualism or uh, inscriptions that are written in two languages or concepts such as colonial context are not defined. And that is a, the thing I am looking at the moment because existing link data representation do not take cultural contact into account. So how can we do this? How can we take cultural contact into account, creating an ontology? and I have created my Coco ontology because it's cultural contact ontology and this is a drawing an example of how could we uh, how we could uh, model a statue which is a statue A coming from uh, Cerro de los Santos which is a uh, has context is a colonial context and has two inscription one inscription is in Iberian and another inscription is in Latin so using models such as this, we could uh, try to uh, uh, model uh, cultural contact in the material record. And we could, could also expand this ontology. We could speak about what type of Iberian is this, because there were 30, 30 Iberians, uh, it was Iberian from the South. We could speak about what type of Latin is this description, if it is earlier or later or, or so on. And finally, uh, future work. Um, I am going to the Digital Humanities Summer School this summer, and there I hope to uh, acquire more technical skills to be able to develop further queries on Baetica and maybe Tarragonensis. I aim to aggregate and normalize data from museums and other data sets if, if I need to, if I find uh, regarding the gaps I have found in the data, develop my ontology, publish my, uh, my data once it is modeled and in RDF, uh, develop a full evaluation of the results and of course compare with already existing uh, research on cultural contact and see what uh, are the uh, results of my research. And this is all. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paula. And we are that's oh, okay. Up, oh, shall we? Great, that's what I was looking for. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go here. Okay, thank you very much, Paula. So I see already one hand raised for Paula. Thank you very much. It was an excellent presentation. I have a question about your um, your indices. You chose the four that you chose. Um, 
I'm wondering what, what made you select those and why, where is pottery in your material <laughs> culture? Okay, very good question. Of course, uh, when I uh, was looking at these indices, I wanted to include pottery. The problem with pottery is that there isn't any data set with the linked open that follows linked open data standards with data from Spain. Okay, so it needed to fulfill all these um, requirements. But yeah, but I am looking into that still, and I would like I would love to do it. But if I introduce, if I include pottery data from other data sets, I might need to integrate all that data from myself to make it into RDF and to yes, to include it in my project. So maybe yes, yeah, I would love to. I know, but yes. Any more questions? Yeah, you may. <laughs> I was interested, one very obvious thing is place names. Yes. Um, and I see that you're using those rather broad uh, place categories. Yes. Uh, Regarding actually, time, there's a lot more that needs to be said yes. about place names, isn't yes. there? And they need to be far more grounded. Yes. Do they overlap with one another? They get yes. stuck spelling, all kinds of things. And I think it was very interesting to to use a sort of recogito kind of approach to some of the texts in which these place names occur mm -hmm. to try to extract more refined lists of those names. Mm -hmm. Or variations. Yes, of variations. I think that would be a very good use of recogito yes. to try and to pull this stuff out. Mm -hmm. Keeping it closely linked to the text from which it comes. Because the problem about the names in Pliny's is that they're just sitting there. You don't know where they've come from. You don't know the text in which that particular text is used. Well, um, I don't know, there might be some old entries. Sorry if I'm yeah. applying <laughs> to this. Um, there might be some old entries that possibly don't have the provenance, but the new standard is that no ancient names can be approved without. Uh, the text, the, the citation of the text, yes. preferably with the, a link to an yes. online resource that visualizes it. Uh, um, it is just impossible to have a name without attestation now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Adrian, for answering. <laughs> Have you found any um, museum collection databases that are open enough and linked enough to be in use to you? No, That's I have a big museum of the road here. The museum of? The British Museum. Ah, yeah, yeah, they are using in data, but they don't have much data relevant to my research, no. And the, muse the Archaeological Museum of Madrid, which I would love to use, it's uh, not in link data, so it doesn't have link data or anything similar, so yeah. Uh, I mean, that's uh, another thing, I, I might need to aggregate data from museums catalogs and so it would be great yes but there is another um other questions well yeah. i was just thinking that a possible outcome of your research at this stage is precisely showing institutions yes. what benefits they might hope to get yes because they're always they're just not just going to do it just because they're going to do it yeah uh, they need to see before they go on and ask for funding, they need to see a, an outcome. And I thought that this kind of answering this kind of question is just the kind of thing that would turn museums on. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. definitely. And even if they don't use link data, that they use vocabulary yeah, and, that they use and that they have open data. I mean, even if they're open data yeah. is in a completely um, you know, opaque format, um, but it uses common vocabulary, someone like Paula can mm. you know, put them the magic she learns in Oxford in a couple of weeks yeah. and can transform that into yeah. a standard that can be used, as long as there's permission to do yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be interesting to try and do that with a target museum, mm -hmm. and then the others would say, oh, I want that too. Mm. Yeah, definitely. A small collection of things, maybe yeah. possible. Yeah, yeah. Maybe a provincial yeah. collection, maybe. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you, Paula. Okay. Uh, I'm very curious about your ontology. Um, and I know it is 
very early stage. I know that you just started thinking about it. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask you if you can tell us um, a few major uh, concepts that you have identified when thinking about cultural contact mm -hmm. that could be modeled uh, in, the, in this ontology. The main ones that I was mentioning that I find uh, a lack in the, yes, so pronouns like when uh, you have a bilingual inscription and you cannot define it as bilingual inscription, mm -hmm. you need to split the inscription into two and say this is a language and this is other. Uh, but it's not two inscriptions, it's a, a, the same inscription that it's in two languages. Uh, or yes, uh, things like cultural contact as a concept or colonial context, uh, if uh, the inscriptions come from a colonial context, yeah. These are the main ones that I have found so far, but I need to look at this much more to see how to develop this ontology. Well, thank you, I think it will be, will be really, really interesting to see how, how it develops. I think that the possibilities of the ontology development are, are very interesting because most of these ontologies are very straightforward in terms of yeah. has color blue yeah. problem <laughs> yeah. solved. Yeah. Um, you've got a different kind of problem for that. You've yes. got sort of all this fuzziness of sort of um, have you been talking to a puny person recently kind of ontology or have yeah. you been talking to a, that nasty Roman who came from somewhere else who you up? Yeah. And you've got to try and find some sort of um, way of structuring mm -hmm. all the multiple, multiple different kinds of contacts. That, might show up in your material. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested to see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Can I ask what you're doing about changing about chronological reference? Mm -hmm. It strikes me that if you if it was all in the same period you'd have very dense links. Mm -hmm. Presumably you've got about six hundred five five hundred years of data, have you? No 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 from second BC to first century AD. So right. three hundred Years of data, yeah. So you're not using any inscriptions that are later than 100? No. Okay. Yeah, because I will be into the imperial period, so I just wanted to keep it yeah. to the Republican, the, yeah, Republic. Are you, are you, is everything being coded in such a way that you can disaggregate by time, or? Mm, I mean, looking into that at the moment, how can, yeah, I need to refine, refine the data, go through it and see how I'm going to record time, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I will invite Lucia as well to come here and if you have some more questions for the both of them, um, we have a little, a little time left. I know we are broadcasting. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, any any final questions for our speakers, or we shall give them the first glass of wine. <laughs> I have a question for, for both of you. Um, it's maybe too simple a question, but um, have you have you found that you're asking any questions about about your data resources or about your um, uh, research resources that the creator of, of those resources clearly haven't asked, or that if you've spoken to the creators that they were surprised that you asked? Are you looking at the data in any way that's different from how the creators of that data are looking at the data? Well, in my case, uh, it's just because um, the data from Spain is different from the rest of the data and maybe they haven't looked into that data so as carefully as they have with the other data. So for example, in Nomisma, the means don't have the dates, but I know that in Nomisma there are all the means that have dates. So that is my case, but I haven't found any questions that they haven't yet asked, maybe in the rest of the... Can I just ask a follow-up? Because yeah. that was sort of my question as well, specifically to do with Nomisma. Is it, is, it, is it because they're difficult to date or because they just haven't provided the information on this? Mm, it, both. Both, because some means it's very difficult. Some it's very difficult to locate geographically mm -hmm. these means, and also because we don't have enough information to to date them, and also because they haven't looked into it very. They haven't uh, 
developed a project only focused on Iberian or Spanish data and they yeah, clean exactly. the data. Presumably yeah. in this case it's whichever whichever data set the listener are getting the information that the Spanish mints from didn't encode the dates in a way that you know, yes. could ingest. So it might be a question of going back to the original project and seeing seeing what's missing. Because then they have to delete information mm -hmm. just if it was in a human readable stream that the yeah. thought, well, we can't do anything yeah. about that programmatically. No, they were very encouraging. Like, you, if you want to, you could go through and ask. I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'd love for you to do that. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, for me, mm -hmm. Maybe mm, it's that uh, for my research, I need to mm, look at uh, the usability of resources from the, uh, the more general point of view, um, wider point of view of usability of resources of other, for other disciplines too, and uh, in our fields, even out of the uh, humanities fields. So I need to apply the mm, uh, the rules, so to say, of uh, usability um, for uh, leading more uh, usable interfaces uh, for uh, websites uh, in general. We need to apply this for pathological resources, and maybe this uh, hasn't uh, been done yet. Uh, yes. Okay. Now to look uh, at the resources from the wider point of view of the usability um, in general, also even um, uh, for commercial uh, websites, something can be useful. That's a follow-up question. Have you asked any questions that your interviewees were surprised by, that they, that they hadn't thought about before? I don't, I don't. Mm -hmm. No, um, I think not specific question, but uh, maybe in general the method, uh, it was unusual, the, the method of uh, interviewing people rather than uh, judging by oneself according to some uh, criteria in abstract. Uh, people were uh, surprised that they was uh, interviewing because uh, in, um, yes, in classics, uh, <laughs> yes, so sometimes they, they ask me uh, some questions like if there is uh, anyone who never uses uh, digital resources, no, they all use. Yeah, the other things are how many users there actually are of the digital resources. How many users? Users there are of these different resources. Are there tens or hundreds or thousands of individual users? Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, yes, the uh, thing to do um, would be to, uh, to to look at the analytics of websites. Uh, uh, in fact, I wanted to, to ask the developers of tools to, if I can access the analytics to know more precisely how many users uh, there are and uh, what uh, pages of resources they focus. Mm -hmm. It might be interesting to find out what they actually do, do as opposed to what they say they do as well. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, uh, because of memory can, uh, can fail and uh, yes, that's why it's also important to do the user observation, which is, however, limited to a certain time and necessary. So. It would be interesting and, and relatively simple, I think, to get a graph of increase of use over time, because that's the other thing. Yeah. Are the over the last X years, however, I'm sorry, I don't think how long is that, eight years, ten years, um, what does that graph look like? Is Or does it stay, you know, did it go to a certain point and stop? Because I think that's something we really need to know, and it's really difficult to, to find that. But also, because of your dissemination of information point, um, how do people find out? Can you see? Somebody writes an article and suddenly there's much more use, and it's really useful to know about that. But I was also thinking about you as a user. Um, 
you or your example of a user using Numisma and wanting to ask a question which, for whatever reason, it isn't answering because actually all of these resources only answer some questions. Mm -hmm. And I think I think we're very interesting to know what you're finding out about the gap between expectation and experience. This idea that somehow if I use an online resource, it will magically resolve every problem I've ever had. <laughs> and the minute it doesn't, oh, this is useless, it, I can't use it at all. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know whether you asked about expectations, disappointment. Did it do what you expected? Did you ask that question? Well, you, yes. you get that feeling. Yes, if they're generally satisfied, uh, if resources meet their expectations, yes, and they now you focus the, a lot on the, the, the problem, but uh, uh, no, users uh, always say that generally speaking they are uh, satisfied with digital resources. Yes. Charlotte, I can answer some of your questions about user growth. On Aura, I believe, in the last 10 years. Um, it's really uneven over the year. Yeah. Um, but you can also see the difference. That actually, the, there's a surprisingly small proportion of expert users. A huge number of people come across digital resources just through Google search and other things. And you can see when you map them geographically that they're coming from all sorts of places that you know that are not specialist university departments. Yeah. Um, there are just too many of them all to be experts anyway. So it's perhaps 80 to 20, sort of general public, mm -hmm. um, interest of people coming in. And then there's 20% you know, not that, there's kind of core serious yeah. heavy user base. Um, so yes, with the peak in the autumn and then in the, in after Easter, we can move down to But yeah, a steady increase year on year, and we've not been able to track things like academic publications, but when things get into the media, yes. then there's a big boost. You do some terrible, I work on the recent stuff, so you do this catastrophe. You <laughs> see big spines, um, and also, and, but it's also often from very top level as well, people don't give down very much. No. Um, we're, we're learning how we to do it. And you might really learning. interesting content, yes. if it's too far down, it's just lots, so um, stuff has to be, yeah, we're jumping that at the moment, push that back up. And again, numbers of, numbers of small screen accesses have just gone disproportionately, just crazy, mm -hmm. we'll be able to keep up with that. So that's what is some of the big programming challenges, actually. Just make it usable in that form. Yes, yes, my core students, you know, they need to come to you know, especially with older resources, which were designed yeah, for, the, for, for the desktop yeah. page, literally. Yeah. Um, it's really quite hard to keep up with those sorts of resources. Um, I think I would have thought most of the projects that you can quite a close eye on those sorts of things. Yeah. I thought also, very interesting, you interviewed a lot of people in places where everybody knows about things. It would be very interesting to know how these resources are used mm. in places without rich academic resources. Yeah. In places mm. who don't have libraries. Yeah. Uh, or, or, which, or who can't keep where the library last bought a book 20 years ago. Those sorts of places. I think it would be extremely interesting sort of second stage. What does this mean mm. to how how does this empower people who don't have the option of going and looking at printed version. And that must be a different kind of response to people who are just using it for convenience. <coughs> yeah, I think that's a big really important. Yeah. Was there another question at the back of the room? No, sorry. <laughs> Well, then let's say thank you again to Lucia and Paola for two very, very interesting uh, presentations. <laughs> um, just a brief reminder that next week uh, on July the 7th, we will have um, Elisa Nuri from King's College London talking about collation visualization, helping users to explore collated manuscripts. 
Um, thank you for following this seminar and see you next week.